Good evening, good morning, good night, good afternoon, wherever you are, whomever you are. Welcome to Voice in the Wilderness. I'm your teacher for the day, for this next couple of hours, next hour and a half. Um, and we, got, we are going to continue in this study, um, which we have technically yet to title, but we, there's a title in mind, and the title is, What is God up to? What is Jehovah up to? What is his intention? From the conception of creation, from its inception, from its beginning, what is his intent? And today I want to remind us that whomever you are, every single person that is that has created that has come up with some idea that has created some ideal share some relationship with that ideal that idea be it uh, technology technology be it uh, 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 engineering uh, be it uh, mathematics so you know Einstein and and be it the the the, the uh, creation of the light bulb or the table or whatever what have you anybody as a matter of fact most things are named <laughs> it's a good one most things are named by the creator Most things are named by their creator. So there is a bond. There is a relationship between you who created something and that thing, regardless of what that thing is, whether it's an inanimate object or no. There's some kind of relationship. And this, I'm saying to you today again, that is the same when it comes to God and his creation. And as we know, because we have been told, <laughs> for those of us who believe in God, for those of us who believe that there is a God, we know what that relationship is between God and his creation. God wants that intimate relationship. He wants that communicative relationship. He desires that whole relationship with his creation. He talks to you, you talk to him, you all have this rapport, you all, you all, you all have this thing going. That's what God desires. And as preparing for this uh, teaching, It's interesting to, to know that it's written in the good book. It's written in the Bible. These words. And I want you to hear these words. Because what I want to do is, I want to read these words. And then I want to go and read some other words from the written word from the text from the book and i want you to set aside everything that you have been taught set aside everything that you know if you can and i don't mean set aside it permanently i mean i want you to set aside it for that moment in the hearing of what I, the words that I'm going to say. And I want you to think about what is God saying when he says this or when this is written. So, if you have your Bible, which I, I urge you to do because I don't want you to take my word for anything. I want you to go and prove what I say by reading what is written. Okay, 
these words are written by the Apostle Paul in the second chapter of Corinthians. In the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5. Okay. If you have your Bibles, which I'm prolonging and giving you time to go and get it, reach over and pull it out of your desk drawer, what have you. We are going to read some words from the second chapter, the second book of Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Because in this teaching, in this topic, we have been saying that God wants to have a relationship with his creation. And I think this, ver this verse says that clearly. Are we ready? Second, Chron Second Cor Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to start in verse 16. And there's some interesting things here in these few passages. But I want to go into the part that speaks about what is God's intention. What is he doing? From beginning to end. Because we have always said. He. He. He speaks the end in the very beginning. I was listening to. Um, an interview uh, an interview of Montel Jordan yesterday he was interviewed for just over two hours phenomenal interview fantastic and he he said that um He, in that interview, they went they they went through his life from beginning to where he was where he is currently, or where he was at that time currently. I don't know how old the interview was. I just, I saw it yesterday. Point I'm making is is, the, is something that he said, which is something we always say, which I believe he got it from the scripture because he knows God. If you look at something in the beginning, you, you can tell how it, it's going to end. And he started off in the interview, the interviewer, the talk about his, how, he, how he grew up in his early days of childhood, how he grew up, the house he grew up in, the community he grew up in, and what he did during the day. And he talked about going to church every day, seven days a week. And I'll leave that right there. In the chapter, in the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, we're going to start in verse, uh, what did I say, 16? But we, we're going to read through that and get down to what we just talked about. What God is doing. What he has been doing from the very beginning. Second Corinthians 5 and 16 says, Therefore we know no one according to the flesh from no one. Even though we have known Messiah according to the flesh, yet now we know him so no more. Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But all things are of God. I want you to hear that. All things are of God. All things are of God. I'm going to reread what I just read to you. 
He said, therefore, having laid out, uh, 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 having laid out some, some, found some stuff before, he goes into, therefore, based on what I've just said, and I don't want to go and read the whole thing, but you could read it and then flow into what I'm we're saying now. Therefore, we know no one according to the flesh. How is it possible for you to not know somebody according to the flesh when we're all human beings in the flesh? So what Paul is saying here is we have to stop looking at the flesh. We have to stop looking at color of skin, at height, at weight, at size. We have to stop looking at prestige, uh, who you are in terms of whether you're a prince or a, a president or a prime minister, whether you are a rich or poor, whether you are young or old, whether you are male or female. See, those things are things of the flesh. I want you to hear me clearly. Those things are things of the flesh. And it's very sad to say that in today's world, as has been throughout the passage, the passage of time, men have looked at each other according to the flesh. Most men, a lot of men. And when I say men, I'm talking about human beings. Human, humanity have looked at humanity through the eyes of the flesh. But Paul laid out this whole spiel in Corinthians 5 from the beginning and, and probably before to get to this point, to let the people, let his hearers know that from now on, after having heard everything I just said, from this point, from now on, therefore, we know no one according to the flesh, according to the outward appearance. Because God himself does not look at the outward appearance. See? Even though, he says, we have known Messiah according to the flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So in the flesh, the word of God was seen walking and talking. And these, there were witnesses, as according to Paul, and, and we all know, who saw the word in the flesh. And Paul says, even though we saw him as a flesh and blood human being, that's not how we see him. He is the word of God. He still is the word of God. He still is God. And so Paul is admonishing his hearers. This is, the, this is what we have to keep in the forefront of our mind, not in the back of our mind, in the forefront of our minds. That this Messiah, this man, that was walking the face of the earth was not a man. He was the word of God. So we, we have to understand that. This is how we have to see him. This is when we think about Yeshua, we have to think about him being the word, being the word, being God's voice, being God's commandment, being God's word, being God's Torah, being God's everything. That's how we have to see him. He's not a flesh and blood person. And as a result of that, he says, therefore, if anyone be in the word, if anyone be anointed, 
If anyone flaws in that understanding, in that breath of wind, in that oil that is rubbed on you, he is a new creature. His eyes are opened, his mind is opened, his heart is opened, and he sees people, he sees things from a different perspective. You're not new in terms of God rebuild you from being white to black or being black to white or being Asian to Mexican or being Mexican to, to Puerto Rican. Or not, 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 not. That's not what he's talking about. Being male to female, being female. No, no, no. That's not what he's talking about, the new creation. The new creation is a, a new creation of perspective. How you see things. How you view things. How you perceive things. You're not perceiving things through the eyes of flesh anymore. You're perceiving things through the eyes of God. You're a new creation. He said the old things have passed away. The way you used to think, the things you used to do, all those things, he says, has passed away. And behold, now you're seeing things with a new perspective. Uh, I, could, I could testify to that in my experience. After coming to that place, and submitting my life and giving my life over. Everything was different. Not, I wasn't different externally. My skin color didn't change. My height, my, my physical features didn't change. My voice didn't change. The way I spoke changed. The way I spoke. The things that I thought about. The way that I thought. Those things changed. Those things made me a, a, a new person. And when people whom I knew in the flesh, <laughs> when they heard me speak and see me do the things that I did after my experience, they were wondering, what happened to Keith? This is not the man we knew yesterday. This is not the person we knew yesterday. This is somebody different. See, even my wife at the time, and I say at the time because it was, was a long time ago and we, we have since parted ways. Even at that time, she said to me one day, you, you're, you're not the same person I married. You're a different person. I want the person I married. I want that person. <laughs> but at that time, all things had passed away and all things became new. And she didn't want the new things. She didn't want the new creature, the new creation. She wanted the old creation. And I couldn't go back. I refused to go back if I could give myself any credit, if I should give myself any credit, which I deserve no credit. But the change in me wasn't because of me. The change in me, as this apostle says, even in the book of Ephesians, when he says, for it is grace, for it is by grace you were saved through faith that not 
of your own. And when faith took me and recreated me, in my experience, with my wife at the time, she didn't want that. And that's all I'll say about that. The relationship was tumultuous. It was rough. And subsequently it ended. He goes on here, Paul, to say, All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And then adds, But all things are of God. See? When many are taught that some things are of God, and other things are of the devil. And that doctrine has destroyed humanity to a certain degree. That doctrine that some things are God and some things are the devil, that doctrine has brought humanity to the point of not accepting responsibility for what they are supposed to be responsible for. Because humanity found a scapegoat. Just as in the garden, the man said was the woman and the woman said was the serpent. Well, the serpent had nowhere to go. So he had to take the whoop. He had to take. Everybody got whooped. But the serpent had no place to turn. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But that doctrine is a false doctrine. And if you read the Bible from cover to cover, if you read it properly, if you read it in the new creative mind, if you read it with the new creative perception, if you read it with the new God-given wisdom, you would understand what Paul is saying. But all things are of God. See, all things God said, the earth is mine, and the fullness thereof, and all they that dwell therein. There is, I God, there is none but me. There is no one beside me. There was no one my equal. There was no one competitive. There is no one to... To run me down, chase me, to run me over or chase me down. There is no one. Whatever happens, happens because I, because of me. Whatever happens, happens because power was given. <laughs> and we talk about that. Power being given. Here Paul is reminding us. But all things are of God. Listen. Who reconciled us to himself through the word of God. The anointed word of God. Who came in the flesh. I know there are people out there hear me say it like that. And they'll be like, ah, oh, he's a heretic. Golly. Listen, listen, but all things are of God who reconciled us to himself through the word of God, the anointed word of God. 
through Yeshua, the Messiah. See, what did Paul just say? A couple of verses before that we read. We see, even though we know him in the flesh, that's not how we see him. That's not where we have him. That's not where we exalt him to. That's not where we put him. He's not just like, he's not just a man. John says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So we either believe that, we believe this, which work hand in hand, or what do we believe? Paul is saying all things are of God. All things are of God who, is not, who has reconciled us. To himself. Why is, why, is, why is God even interested in reconciling us? Why is there any reconciliation taking place? Why? It's because the creator wants to have a relationship with his creation. He reconciled us through Yeshua the Messiah and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. Namely, listen to the name of the ministry of reconciliation. No, it's not handwriting of Yehovah. That's our name. <laughs> namely, that Yehovah, that Elohim, was in the anointed one in Messiah, reconciling the world to himself. In that he's not reckoning to them their trespasses, but having committed to us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation is another way of saying the gospel. It's another way of saying the good news. It's another way of saying, listen, God has given us some information that we need to share with the world. And hopefully, when we share this information with the world, the, those who hear, let he who have ears to hear, Hear what the Spirit of God is saying. So, what is God up to? What is Yehovah up to? What is Yah up to? Yehovah is intent on establishing this relationship with his creation. That was his intent from the beginning. That was his intent. We all have some kind of connection to anything we have put our hands to do. There is some kind of connection. Somehow, some way, there is a connection. There is nothing, there is no connection greater. There is no connection deeper. There is no connection wider. There is no connection higher than God's connection with his creation. Let's go back. Yeah. Let's go back and read just a few passages of scripture. Let's just go back and read some, some things that God had said and see what does he, why would he say that? What, what is that about? Let's see if we can see this relationship. 
Let's see if we could say, oh yeah, that's what he, that's what, oh, okay. I'm starting Genesis 126. Now remember, I asked you guys to set aside everything you've heard before. Just let's focus in on what we're getting ready to read. I'm, I'm just going to read some passages that I picked out. And perhaps as I read, God will deposit some more passages that we could read and just and just talk about it. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the livestock, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So created man in his own image in God's image, he created he, he created him male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. When you hear that, what are you thinking? And God said, let us make man in our image. Why would God even think about making a man in his image? What's the purpose of that? Why is that? Why? Well, anything anybody creates is created in technically their image. And sometimes... Because of that, the use of that word image, we could think that it's a reflection of that person in terms of identical reflection. In other words, I look in the mirror and I see myself and I say, I'm going to create that. Well, in essence, that's not only what that create, creating in, its, in, your, in your image that that means because i can have something in mind that looks nothing like me and i create it and say i created that in my image in other words i created that based on the image that i got in my mind in my spirit in my head that's what i created and that thing that I have created, can I, I can say, is an image of me. It reflects me. Right? But if we, even if we think, because we know that in places in the written word, it says God is not a man or is not like man that he should lie. Neither is he like the son of man, that he should repent. If he said it, he will do it. In another place it said, God is a spirit. Right? So if God is not a man, or is not like man, if God is a spirit, this image that he created in his image He gives a name. He calls that image humans, human being. He calls the image a human being. And he says, 
Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the livestock, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, is the image a reflection of God? Or is the image something God created because this is what he wanted to create? If the scripture said God is not a man or not like man, if the scripture says God is a spirit, what am I? What are you? So God, in, his, in the very essence of what he's created, is making statements about himself. And we can look at ourselves and we can think about the kinds of persons we are and ask ourselves, is this who God is? Or is this how God is? We get jealous. We get angry. We hate. We despise. Right? We have mercy. We, are, we can be just. Right? We, we can be loving and kind and patient and all that good stuff. So is he. Does that mean that we are gods like him? Because remember, he created us. You know, I used to, growing up as a kid, um, in, 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 in my day, movies was, there was a, there was a period of time where, where, uh, uh, movies, Kung Fu movies were the thing. Kung Fu movies, right? Uh, Fearless Hyena and, you know, uh, uh, six, not, not, I, I'm trying to remember some names. Heroes 2, you know, the invinc Invincible Armor and all those Kung Fu movies, right? Shaolin, the eight Shaolin monks and all these things, right? Shaolin Temple and all these Kung Fu movies. And you might, you might be familiar with some of them. But what I'm, what I want to, the point I want to make is by going back there in my memory is because... In, in some of these movies, you would, you would have a, a, a teacher and a, and a student. And, and in some of these movies, the students would always try to become better than the teacher. Which technically, every teacher, right, always wants his students to become better than him. From a good perspective. But it's that is from a human perspective. It's kind. You could say it's. I don't want to say it's impossible, right? But the the irony of the two, right? Because if I'm the teacher and I'm teaching you, and everything you know. You learn from me, then how is it possible, listen, for you to be better than me? If everything you learn, you learn it from me. The question then becomes, am I going to teach you everything I know? Everything. Withholding nothing. And from a human perspective, we could see the, 
the back and forth. We could see the irony, right? Is a teacher going to give his pupil, teach his pupil every secret about himself? Um, the past few days, they've been showing Kill Bill. I don't know if, I don't know if you guys are uh, fans of Kill Bill, but you, you see what, what I'm talking about. David, uh, David Carradine sends his, his protege, Uma Thurman, uh, not his, his, his love interest, whatever, whatever, however. You know what I'm talking about. He sends her to this, uh, inch, to this Kung Fu expert to learn some things. Right? David is thinking that these, there are certain techniques that she will never learn because the man, the teacher, will never teach her those things. <laughs> right? But in the end, he realized what happened because he died in the end. And just before he died, she did a technique that she learned from the from the master that he, he thought she would have never learned because the master would never teach it to her. Well, if this is, if there is so much irony and so much debate and so much back and forth and so much doubt in the possibility of the pupil becoming better than the teacher, how could the human become better than God. How could he even come become equal to God? How is that possible? When God says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, goes on to talk about the gulf between our ways of thinking. And then even in another place says, the secret things belong to God. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna like me. But I'm telling the truth. He goes on to say, the secret things belong to God. But the things that are revealed belong to man. Right? So there are secret things that belong to God. Yeshua said in the gospel, I have many things to tell you, but I can't tell you. <laughs> there are many things that I need to say to you, but I cannot say them because either they are forbidden for me to say them, or you're not in a place to hear what I'm what I could say to you. Paul says he went up to the, to the place up in the third heaven and he, he heard of things that he, he can't even repeat. He can't repeat them either because he can't remember. If we think about all the plethora of reasons why he couldn't repeat them, he, he maybe couldn't remember all the things he heard. Maybe the things he heard, he don't, he have no clue about what he heard because you could hear things and he'd be like, I don't understand that. So he, he really wasn't listening. Maybe he was told never to ever repeat anything he heard. Or maybe when he came back, he can't repeat it because it was taken from him. He, he got caught up. He heard things. And when he came back, the things he heard, he can't remember them. He, he, he lost them. They took it back. Secret things belong to God. <laughs> the things that are revealed belong to man. And, you know, to, so that hopefully we'll get better at the things we do. If that is the case, then we have to look at the difficulty or the impossibility of a student becoming equal to or better than his teacher.
Unfortunately, today, in today's society, in today's world, we have people who do not believe in God. We have people who do not believe there is a God. And so, because they don't believe that there is a God, and they don't believe in a they, they don't believe in God, right? They end up confused, they end up dismayed. They don't know how to discern the truth. See? To be able to discern the truth, you have to believe in God. If you, if you believe there is no God, the proverb said, the fool says in his heart there is no God. If you believe there is no God, According to what Proverbs said, you're a fool. That's the first bad thing. That's the first dangerous thing. And imagine how many fools we know out there who's perpetuating to be the brains behind everything. <laughs> Do you hear what I just said? I, I just heard what I said and didn't believe what I just said. Didn't believe that I said that. So I need to say it again. The book of Proverbs, it is written that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And there are people, there are many people out there in different echelons of life, in different echelons of society, who believe there is no God. And those people, according to what Proverbs says, are fools. So then there are many fools out there who are perpetuating that they know I can't even remember what I they know stuff but if you're a fool you, you can't the stuff you think you know can't be wisdom it can't be real it can't be genuine because you're a fool. Because you think there is no God. You think you God. Right? And could you imagine how many people listen to all of those people? Who you listen to? From the stars, from the superstars, from the billionaires. From the, 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 from the governors, the rulers, the kings, the presidents, the prime ministers. If they are ruling and governing, if they are multi-millionaireing and multi-billionaireing, if they are stars and superstars, and they don't believe in God, if they are, and I've said this before, there are a plethora of scientists and I say in the high 90s percentile, who don't believe in God. Most scientists do not believe in a creator God. You see what I'm saying? Because for them, it's extremely difficult to prove that there is a creator God. And scientists want to, they have to prove everything. When God operates a little differently. God operates a little differently. Because he created you and he know what's in you. 
And in every human being that was ever born is a thing called belief. In every single human being. We are talking about what is God up to? Well, if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe there is a God, how, how, do, you, how do you know what, how do you expect to know what he's up to? If you are confused, and we are living in a society today that's full of confusion because the people in the highest, in the highest excellences of life, they lie, as the old folks would say, they lie through their teeth. There are so much lies that's going around. It's difficult for the very elect to even discern the truth. And it's getting worse. It's not getting better. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. So think about that for a moment. If you're confused because you're listening to the stars and the superstars, you're listening to the quote-unquote people who Supposed to be in the know. They are supposed to know stuff. See, that's where we fall. That's our biggest downfall. Because we trust in the arm of flesh. And I think the, pro the, the Proverbs or the Psalms say something about those who trust in the arm of flesh. It's not a good thing. Well, how do I know? How would I know that, that you know... This Bible is, is God's word because man's written that Bible. It's mankind that's written the Bible. Well, just so you know, ma'am, sir, mankind has written everything in history. Animals don't write. Birds don't write. Human beings is the only... It's the only... Entity that writes. So who would God speak to to write? That's the first thing. Or should that be the second thing? Because the one who is acclaimed, the one who is credited with the writing of what God said, he said, God is the one who wrote on the two tablets with the finger of God. Moses is credited for writing the five books of Moses. Most traditions, most religious Traditions believe that. Yet Moses himself, according to the people who wrote that Moses wrote the book, say Moses said that I didn't write that. God wrote that with his with the finger of God. <laughs> I didn't write them two tablets, them words, them ten words. I didn't write that. God told me to get two tablets of stone and bring it to me and I will write on the tablets of stone my covenant. And God wrote on the two tablets of stone his covenant on both sides and gave it to Moses. And Moses went down the mountain the first time. And that's when they was by the mountain with the calf. And they was having a party. And they was doing whatever. And Moses got ticked off. And he took the two tablets of stone. And he tossed them down the mountain. And you know what happened? So Moses broke the covenant. Broke the two tablets of stone. And then God told him, and subsequently, 
to cut two more tablets and bring it up on the mountain again and I will rewrite the ten words. And the second time, God was the one who still wrote the ten words. So there is at least one account or two accounts that explicitly states man didn't write that. And that came from the man who was credited to write the five, the first five books of Moses, which we call the word of God, the Torah, right? So, think about that. We are talking about what is God up to? And again, I must emphasize, God makes things simple for us. Simple. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish and the sea and so on and so on and so on. And, so on. and God created man in his image. He created he, him, male and female. He created them. And then God blessed them. See, God, a blessing is, a, is, a, is an empowerment. God blessed them and said, be, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. God gave them the power. God empowered them with the ability to be fruitful and to multiply and fill the earth and to subdue the earth. He gave, he gave them that. He gave them that. Listen. If you don't have authority, you can't give authority. And every single human being on the face of this living earth who has authority was given that authority. They didn't just wake up that one morning and say, I have authority. So this is what is going to. No, 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 no. That person was given authority. Nobody has authority. We, authority is given. It is distributed from the authoritarian. From the one who has all. And the one who has all wants to reconcile the world to himself. From the beginning. Is what he's been doing. Let's look at another passage of scripture. Uh, let's go to Genesis 2. Let's go to Genesis 2. Are we there? 2 and 15. Jehovah Elohim took the man and put him in the garden to cultivate and keep it. Jehovah Elohim, Elohim commanded the man saying, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in that day you eat it, you will surely die. Again, Setting aside everything that you dream about that was said. Even what I have said previously. Because you listened to my, one of my teachings. What is God saying here? What is the intent? What is his motive? What is the purpose? What garden? God created, so, God, as I've said before, God has created everything, including the man. And now he takes the man, put him in the garden to do what? To cultivate and keep it. To serve the garden. To be of service to the garden. 
So if the garden needs to be serviced, the man should service it. Well, if I am put there to serve the garden, that must mean that at some point the garden will be will need to be served. At some point, the garden is going to come up with a need and that need I have to take care of. So the garden was never to stay in the perfection for perpetuity. God created everything and the things he created, his intention was never to keep that thing in the degree of perfection for perpetuity. Why? Because he creates the man and he tells the man, I'm putting you in the garden and I want you to cultivate the garden and serve it, keep it, take care of it, put it, get hands on, be hands on, touch, you know, feed the garden, serve the garden, take care of the garden. That means the garden, there was, there is a need for the man. That means God knew when he created the garden that at some point the trees are going to be overgrown. The shrubs are going to become, the grass is going to get wild. The animals are going to need a haircut. They're going to need a bath. They're something. He, God knows all these things. So he says to the man, Bam, I'm putting you in there. Cultivate, keep, take care of. Eat what you want. As a matter of fact, the only thing, my only instruction, mind you, my only instruction Why is God giving instructions? Why is God commanding a man these two things? Why? You have kids? Do you know anybody who have kids? Do you any do you know anybody who have kids who don't tell them who don't Give the kids instructions. Do you know anybody like that? I hope you don't. <laughs> I hope you don't because that would be crazy. So it's a natural part of a relationship. It's a natural ebb and flow of any kind of relationship. That the one who is in charge gives instruction to those subordinate to him. The man isn't equal to God. The man is subordinate to God. And so the man understands that. And so does God. And what does God do? God, for the man's safety... For the man's protection, which any boss or any father, anybody would do to their subordinates. It's, it's first, first thought, how to protect, how to protect, how to protect, how to protect. So my protection to you, man, is... You can eat everything except don't eat from, don't do this, particular, don't do this single thing here. Because in the day you do it, you will die. I would whoop your butt. 
you would get a demotion. You would get fired. You would, something bad is going to happen. So don't do this. We know what happens. It's, uh, let's read something else. Genesis 3. Let's go 8 and 9. They heard Jehovah Elohim's voice walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Jehovah Elohim among the trees of the garden. And Jehovah called to the man and said, where are you? And we talked about this. All these verses we have gone over and over and over. Set aside all of that. They heard the voice of God walking. I have said in many times, many times past, in many teachings, that when you see terms like the commandments, the voice of God, the word of God, you know, you know, the statutes of God, the Torah, all these things, they're synonyms. Because God goes nowhere without his word. Wherever he is, his word is there. His, he is his word. So when we read, they heard of Jehovah Elohim's voice walking in the garden. It's not his voice that's walking in the garden. It's God is walking in the garden. They heard that wind coming at them, coming through the garden. They knew who it was. Why would they know that wind? Why would they know that voice? Why are they so familiar? Is it the first time? Is it the second time? Is it the only time? Doesn't tell us. But I want you to think about God. Do you think this is the first time God is, his voice is, Walking through the garden in the cool of the day. No, it can't be the first time. That's not how God is. When you're in relationship, when you're in, in tuned, you, you always have that communication going. Even when you're away, even when you're away from your work, every so often you think about your work. Even when you're away from your wife or your husband, every so often you think about them. From the kids, same thing. From your house, the same thing. From your car, the same thing. When you're away, you think they, they, they all. So you have the, you, that connection still flowing. And we talked about this at length in a subsequent message. As a matter of fact, this, this passage is what we started the teaching, Where Are You? This, this is the passage we used to begin that, that uh, series, Where Are You? Because in this, in, the, in, this, in this two verses, the question comes up, Where are you? As if God doesn't know where they are. When your wife call or your husband call or your son call 
and ask, or you call and say, where are you? You may not know where they are. <laughs> but when God calls and asks, where are you? He knows where you are. So he's not asking, where are you? In terms of, well, I don't know where you are. <laughs> And as we read these passages, we see that there is a relationship between God and what he's doing. There is that communication. There's a relationship. There's something happening every time. Genesis 4. We know Genesis 4. We know the Cain and Abel story. Right? Again, I, I'm not, I don't know your extent, to, to what extent you think about things. I know to what extent I think about things. Right? And to some degree, sometimes I don't know the extent because sometimes I begin to think about something and then the extent just extends. <laughs> I'm fixing my, my headphones, sorry. Right? From the perspective of the spirit because it begins to see more and more and more and more and more and hear more and more and more and more and more. And, more. and in this passage, in the verses 13 through 15, Cain said to Jehovah, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And that's after uh, we know Cain presented an offering to Jehovah and Abel did the same. And we know God, Jehovah appreciated Abel's offering, but he didn't like Cain's offering. And if you go to that series, um, I can't remember the title, but we talked about why. We talked about the heart issue, you see. Cain had a heart issue, not, not, not a heart attack or anything like that. Not that kind of heart issue, but Cain had an issue in his heart. He had an ought. He had an issue against his brother. There was something, there was something unseen by everybody else except God. And apparently Cain. Because even though God spoke to him about the issue, he still went ahead and did what he did in killing Abel. Right? And so after he killed Abel, God comes to him again and God has a conversation and God says, you getting it this time, bro. I warned you. You you crossed it. You crossed the line. And so after God issues the punishment, Cain has a complaint. <laughs> it's like remind me of my kids. When they do stuff and they get they they act like they ain't do nothing. I didn't do anything. So I, I just whooped you for no reason. I shouted at you for no reason. I chastised you for no reason. I am just a wicked daddy that I would just see my son well behaved, doing nothing, and just decide I'm going to whoop you. I don't think that's how it happens. I don't think that's how it goes. But Cain complains nonetheless. He says, Cain said to Jehovah, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me out today from the surface of the ground. I will be hidden from your face. 
which is something God promises us all. When we rebel to certain degrees, God says he's going to hide his face from us. And in this case, Cain says, this part, I can't bear this punishment. Because this is the punishment. You've driven me out today from the surface of the ground. I will be hidden from your face. Which means I wouldn't see you. I can't talk to you. I can't call out to you. I don't know where you will be. That's a big deal. So Cain understood to some degree that God wanted to have a relationship with him. If he didn't know that, if he didn't think that, why is he complaining? He know what he just did. He just killed a man. What you think you could just kill a man and just nothing is going to happen? That's not how it that's not how it works. So by his complaint we can deduce a lot of stuff. He said, I will be hidden from your face. And in addition to that, I will be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth. And whosoever finds me will kill me. It's so ironic and crazy and weird and bad and stupid and foolish and all of these things that you will kill somebody and then when you get your punishment your complaint is well they going somebody going to find me and kill me come on man what do you think you think you could just kill somebody and nothing is going to happen to you? You think you could just kill somebody and you're going to be okay? That's not how it works. And in the interview yesterday, Montel, Montel Jordan used a word, re, recoupable, recoupable or something like that. Everything is recoupable. <laughs> Oh, hey, you, you gotta watch that interview. It's really awesome. It's kind of his life story. It's really awesome. Because God understands how life works, God understands how things operate. We don't. We think we understand. We think, you see? We have this foolish notion that we know everything. And we don't. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. Think that you would kill somebody, commit atrocities, and everything is going to be okay with you. According to the guy in Doctor Strange, what, what, did, what did he say? The black guy in the end, he said what? The bills come due. <laughs> the 
The bills come due. It is so ironic in this verse, Cain just killed his own brother and is now complaining that his punishment is greater than he can bear. I'm going to be scattered from the surface of the ground. I will be hidden from your face. I will be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. Well, duh. And in all of that, having done what he did, and now complaining about his punishment, here comes God. And God says to him, Therefore, whom, in verse 15, <laughs> whomever slays Cain, listen, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. Even in his complaint, God Here's his complaint. And maybe God says, you know what? You're right. I don't want you to suffer death that way. You must be punished until you understand what you did. So I'm not saying that's, that's why God tweaked the punishment. I'm just saying... Maybe. Because when you die, your suffering ends, right? Until the judgment. So maybe, I don't know, maybe he played himself into a bigger hole. <laughs> because the suffering now is going to go on, not perpetually, but the suffering is going to go on longer in the earth, that is. Because if nobody finds him and kills him, that means he's going to, he's going to, the suffering is going to be extended. So maybe he, play, maybe, maybe he plays himself into a deeper hole. God said to him, therefore whoever slays Cain, Vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And to ensure that nobody slays Cain, God, the Lord, appointed a sign for Cain so that anyone finding him would not strike him. You <laughs> see what I'm saying? There is this back and forth. There is this relationship. Regardless of how good or how bad, regardless of left or right, regardless of up or down, there is this relationship. Let's look at another one. Genesis 5. This is kind of my favorite. Genesis 5, verse 23 and 24. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not found. <laughs> For God took him. This is kind of grown on me to the point where I can call it one of my favorite verses because of the mind-blowingness of it, because of, because of the words that are spoken, because of the words that are written, because of the thoughts that these spoken words, that these written words, the, the, the thoughts that they generate. What was it about Enoch? 
What was it about Enoch? What kind of person was Enoch? That God was so pleased with him. That God took him. And you'll be like, well, how you could say, oh, you know God was pleased with him. Because of what was said before. And Enoch walked with God. That phrase, walked with God. Walked. That phrase spells out a belief system. A, a faith system. That phrase spells out a lifestyle. Of being in God so strong. But God just liked them so much, loved them so much, that God just took him. <laughs> he just took God just took him. <laughs> can I do I know anybody that can I think of anybody else? I can say Abram, but God never took Abram. Maybe Elisha, because God took Elisha, right? Took him up in the, in the heavens. But go looking back, maybe David, but he, I don't think he liked David that much. Moses, you know, God and Moses, he spoke to Moses face to face. But he didn't, he didn't take Moses up. At least, you know, not without... Moses doing stuff. You know what I'm saying? Moses did some things. It, with Enoch, it just says he walked with God. And then his wife was looking for him. His children was looking for him. Wait, anybody see Enoch? Hey, what? Anybody see Enoch? No. One day pass, two day pass, three days, four days, five days, a week, two weeks, three weeks, four. Nobody could find Enoch. I don't know how they knew God took him. He disappeared. He vanished off of the face of the earth. God took him. What was it? What? Who was Enoch? What was he like for God to take him? It, when you read about Enoch, all you know is he had children. He had this amount of children. And he walked with God. And God, he couldn't be found because God took him. That's all you know about Enoch. What does that say about God? It says God is looking for people who are interested in looking for him. See, a relationship is two ways. It's not one way. And when we go into Abram or Abram, we see the same thing. Why did God choose Abram? Why did God say to Abram, get out of your father's house and of your father's kin family and go to a place and I will show you that place? It's because he knew Abram would raise up his children, would teach his household in the way of Jehovah, to follow Jehovah. To be in relationship with Jehovah. That is the key. What is God up to? God is about relationships. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And there are many fools who are in positions of leadership.
who claim to want to lead people the right way. They are fools because they don't believe in God. They don't believe there is a God. They have taken the belief that was given to them and they have turned it against he who has given it to them. Who are you following? Who are you listening to? Do, does that person believe in God? Does that person believe in a God? Does that person believe in the only God? Not just in a God. That's a dangerous statement in itself. Does that person believe in this God? This God of creation? And that's a question you can answer. You can find the answer to that question. Yeshua said you will know them by their fruit. What do they do? What do they say? Who they support? Who they give credence to? What kind of laws they uphold? What kind of laws they want to pass? What kind of things they want to implement as leaders? You will know them by their fruit. There are many leaders today who do not believe in the God of creation. Many. There are many people today who do not believe in the God of creation. What do you believe? And we'll close right there. We'll take it up next time. This message is about God, the actions of God, the movement of God, reconciling the world to himself. That's what he is doing. That's what he is doing through his word, through his Messiah, through his son, through himself, he is reconciling the world. He is wanting to create in you a new creature, a person who sees things from a different perspective, who would look at man and not look at them by their skin color, by their height, their weight, their size, their denomination, their um, echelons in society, by how much money they have, what kind of house they live in, what kind of car they're driving, who they are, whether they're the president, the vice president, the king, the, the prince, the queen. They, it doesn't matter. That's not how you look at a person. That's what God is trying to do with us. He's trying to open our hearts and our minds to this new creation. Turning your Bibles to what? Numbers chapter 6, as we say. Numbers chapter 6, verse 22 through 27. See, this is the good news. This is the good news right here. The good news is that any man who is in God, any man who, who has been dosed in the oil, any man who has been smeared with the oil, 
who has been breathed upon the breath of life. Any man who believes in God can become a new creature. All things will pass away. All things will become new. And people will get mad at me. You should say Jesus, Jesus. No, see, you think that. You think that. Based off of what I read, I know who Yeshua is. I know who he is. And Paul says, all things are of God. And when we look at Yeshua, with Yeshua we can look at him as a flesh man. <laughs> Even though we knew him as a flesh man. He is the word of the living God. And I believe in the word of the living God. I believe in God. And based off of that, I have become a new creature. Based off of him, his faith, his grace, his mercy, his kindness. And as a result of that, you become obedient to him. You become obedient. You obey his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Well, who is my? Who is the my in my commandments? If Yeshua is saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. Who is the my? See, we taught the doctrine. We have been taught the doctrine throughout Christianity that the law is dead. No, the law isn't dead. <laughs> the law is alive. Mufasa is alive. The lion of the tribe of Judah lives. He's not dead. He lives. God is alive. He is living. He is breathing. He is moving. And he wants to reconcile you to himself. Through his word. Number six, verse twenty through verse twenty through verse twenty two through twenty seven reads as follows. And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is how you shall bless the children of Israel." You shall tell them, Jehovah bless you and keep you. Jehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Jehovah lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. And the good news is, so they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them.
What is God up to? God is up to reconciling the world unto himself. He's up to making this relationship eternal. I suggest you get on board. In the meantime, Shavua Tov, Shabbat Shalom, Buen Nui, Adios, Buenas Tardes, Buenas Noches, Buenos Dias, Arrivederci, Deuces, Pie, Peace, I'm out.